This is the voice of the Report of the Week, signing on. Before I say anything more, okay, as I said last week, as I'll probably say next week, and so on, I think this show was another piecemeal mess. And that's what I think of it. You won't be able to tell the editing, but when, as I see it, I see it as a mess. Anyways, it's going to be implied in this program that there will be a, f a few segments that aren't here. Okay, in this program I imply, as there is in every show, that there's going to be a, a letter segment, a fan mail segment. There is not one in this program. I've been putting it off for too long, and I said, you know what, we're going to upload one without the, the letter segment. And I'm going to upload another one, probably very early next week, that's mostly going to be reading and responding to letters of some brief discussion at the beginning. Okay. So, that's the first thing. That's different than what I say in, in this recording, which was recorded uh, about five days ago. Second change in this program is night walks. Now you're getting, you're getting a treat. For those of you who like night walks, you're going to like this. Okay? So listen up. You're going to like this. You're not getting just one night walk. Okay? You're getting two. That's right, two night walks. You're getting about an hour and 45 minutes worth of night walks. The first one is the lecture series, in which I talk about the suits for about 40 minutes. Now the second one you might find a little interesting. It's a 50-minute walk. And in it, I talk about an encounter back in 2014 I had late at night in which someone might have been casing out my house and might have planned on, on uh, robbing it. And I think it'll be very interesting, and I hope you find it interesting too. But that was off the cuff. I, you know, I, I just decided to do that on the spot. So I hope you enjoy that one. And third... You're going to notice that I may imply that there's another lecture from a, uh, a social psychology viewpoint in this VORW. That's not here. All right, it's just not. It uh, might come into next week's one. We'll see. I have, right now I have more priorities. I have better things to talk about, things I want to talk about more, that I can talk about more. And that's where it stands right now. But I had to make this announcement at the very beginning because otherwise if I splice it up and chop it up more than it already is and it's in a million pieces and it's a mess. Um, if, I, if I chop it up anymore it'll be un, unintelligible and unlistenable and I have to sort around for every time I try to mention one of these things and erase it and it'll just be me skipping and audio jump cuts everywhere and I don't want to do that. So this is the little... You know, the little uh, disclaimer and a little note at the beginning for what's to be expected. Nonetheless, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoy the program. Remember, letters will be read in the next program, which should be up next week, early on. And that's what we got. This is VORW, the voice of the Report of the Week. Enjoy the program. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone listening. This is VORW, the voice of the Report of the Week. The international service of this channel, the Report of the Week, signing on to YouTube once again. Another week, another program, another show, live for your listening pleasure. I am your host, Report of the Week, and here we are, present. The current time is 8.57 p.m. Eastern Time, and it is a Saturday evening, ladies and gentlemen, a Saturday evening in April. To be exact, it is April the 9th, 2016, the time this is being recorded. Ideally, if we can get this out Sunday the 10th, that'd be nice. Otherwise, Monday, this VORW will be right at your your feed, or, you know, your metaphorical doorstep, as they say. Hot and fresh to start off the new week. So, as we always begin our program with, simply put, how are you? I hope you're doing all right. I hope you are well. I sure do. I sure do. 
So I, I hope you're well. I hope you're uh, doing okay. April can be uh, can be a mixed a mixed month. It 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 really you know it really really can be. It can be mixed. Okay. Some Aprils are good. Some are bad. April for me is uh, well. This April is going okay. <clears throat> I uh, I was able to make a a nice stride to being where I want to be in life. Finally, it's you know I'm as 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 I've thought from time to time. I'm an unconventional person, and sometimes an unconventional life suits me better than a uh, you know the going the average route. Sometimes you gotta. If you truly want to be happy, sometimes you got to bushwhack and make your own route in life. And if it works, and you found your own little niche, you know, just just do whatever you can to to preserve that for as long as you can. Um, but that's that's where I am now. That's where I am. Here we are, and. Uh, <laughs> And uh, this is what we've got on VORW. So it's a Saturday, and uh, it was a uh, well, it was a miserable day today, weather-wise. I always like to introduce with the weather, of course. It was a it was a miserable day weather-wise. Let's uh, it's dark now. Let's close the curtains here. We don't want anyone looking in. Not that anyone actually would be, but you know more comfortable. I mean, normally I leave them closed all the time, but sometimes some sunlight, you know, some natural daylight will help save the light bulbs. But, you know, I'm a, I'm a real night person. I I love the night. Um, it's great. And uh, I think darkness is, uh, is a great thing. And if you're, you, you like to really just accept it, absorb it, not be really afraid of night, as some are. It can be a great thing. It can be a time that's very easy on the eyes, not too many people around. You can go out when the weather is nice, take a nice little stroll. Matter of fact, you get a night walk in this program, believe it or not, you do. The night walk is usually always recorded uh, before everything else, usually, and that's no exception. Though, admittedly, I'll say without hesitation, I think I screwed up on this night walk. And that's how I am. I'm, I'm, I try to be blatantly honest with you guys, and I think, I think I screwed up on this night walk. Reason being was because as I was, as I was taking the walk, I was feeling rather audacious. And I said, you know, it'll, I'm going to stop back around the the house, because I did my circuit, it was a little shorter, because it was freezing cold, it was, uh, 29 outside, and I know that may not seem like it's too cold, I mean, it's cold enough to kill you, you know, if you're out there long enough, you'll die, but of course it's not the coldest it's ever been, nor is it the coldest I've ever walked in, but, compared to the fact that it was in the 80s, just a few days beforehand, made it feel a whole lot colder than say it were the middle of the winter and temperatures were normally like this. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, it was uh, it was quite cold. Bitterly cold, my hands were, uh, as I was recording, my hands became uh, red in color and uh, became numb. I couldn't feel them. But I was feeling audacious and they said, I'll, uh, so I had I had more to say on this this uh, part of the lecture, and uh, I was I was saying, well, perhaps I'll go in, I'll get some gloves, and I'll do another circuit because I still have more to say. And unfortunately, as I was about to make my voyage back, there was a distraction. There were some people who usually go to the uh, go to the local uh, local wooded area and like to uh, drink and, you know, do all that stuff. And I didn't want to really cross their paths today. They can be a, a rowdy bunch. 
if I say so myself. So, uh, anyways, by the time I got back in, I was, you know, so cold, had to get a little bit of uh, a lukewarm water to put my hands in. <laughs> never hot water, by the way. When you have really freezing cold hands that were just in the cold, never put them in hot water. Lukewarm, that's what you gotta do. If you expose the hands so cold to, to hot water, it's just absolutely painful and it's just not good for you. Um, you gotta be lukewarm at first, and then as I start to recover, you could increase the temperature to your liking. So I ran it under that for a little bit, and then they were fine, of course. But uh, anyway, so for the next night walk I do, I've got these. These uh, They're called Hot Hands Hand Warmers. They're air activated, and there's two of them, up to 10 hours of heat. So uh, maybe I'll go out for a walk tonight, maybe not. If I go out tonight, it'll be really late, because there's some weather moving through now, so i got to wait for it all to finish up. I might use one of these hand warmers, and I might put it in one of my overcoat pockets. So uh, when I hold the microphone with one hand, I'll hold the hand warmer with the other. So I'll get it nice and toasty, and then I'll switch hands. And I think that could be a good strategy. I think I'll do that. And it's air activated too, so I could even if it gets real bad, I can hold it in the same hand as the microphone and uh, figure something out. But anyways, because of that, I kept saying in the lecture, it's going to be, you know, you're, there's going to be more of a continuation, but you're not even going to notice it. Well, that continuation never happened, so I apologize there, and I might have to just splice it a little bit and make a comment saying that the remainder of it will be in the next program. This lecture series, believe it or not, the pace that it's going at will probably, probably end up uh, being over... A, over a dozen parts, I figure. Just something to talk about during the night walks, you know? Something to talk about. But, uh, I hope a few people find it interesting. If anything, not for the topic, but perhaps for the atmosphere of being able to take that walk. You know, being able to walk and talk and hear whatever it may be, the planes or the train horn or the winds or some sort of nighttime creature milling about and uh, and so on but anyways let's see let's see what we got here I think what we're gonna do and you can hear the uh, <laughs> Amusingly enough, you can hear the um, you can hear the computer making the noise that it sometimes does. But you know, I think we were able to survive through the last program with the computer making some noise, and no one really, no one really commented or was extremely irked by it or whatever it may be. So, anyways, that's what we have. Um, as I mentioned, weather today was a bitter day. I think the high got to 45 Fahrenheit. Um, you know, it's it's uh, cold. No, it's 41 now. And, uh, oh well. Rain and snow mixture fell today. Beautiful April weather, of course. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what faced us today. That's what faced us today. And that's what there is. No real accumulation, significantly at least, of the, any sort of snow. Just, you know, roads are wet. And uh, hopefully they won't stay that for too long so I can go out later. You know, if they, I mean, if, if there's ice everywhere, part of me, I'd still go out. But I've known, I've known uh, someone years back who personally died from slipping, so that's taking a risk. I know, I say, yeah, well, I can get traction, but... There's been many a time when I've gotten on ice and I've had no control of what happens, so... I guess, I guess if it's too icy I won't go out, so you can all enjoy some more 
food reviews from me for another day. But, uh, what else? Today I went with a bow tie. That's a rarity now. Went with the bow tie, of course. That's what I was wearing in the re review. Wearing the bow tie. It's a, uh, oh, I forget what they call it. It might be a diamond tip bow tie. Might be that. I'm actually going to try a new style soon. I know I like some of those Victorian era fashions. Sometimes, you know, I wear the wing collar and necktie or the uh, stand-up imperial collar with a necktie or frock coat. And uh, I was thinking about Sigmund Freud last week. I was looking at some pictures of him and uh, I liked how he he went with a very, not the most popular Victorian style, but it was one nonetheless. Uh, where you wear the, a black bow tie with a three-piece suit and you tuck it underneath the collar so that it looks like a black neckband. But I bought uh, two black bow ties and I've got my, uh, I've got a black three-piece suit at the cleaners right now and it's getting ready to be brought back into service so I can, can start breaking that look out. And we'll see how that goes. But I'm going to start doing that. So, you know, that's, uh, that's what we've got. <clears throat> In today's program, you can expect the following. For sure, you can expect a night walk. Of course, you can expect letters and the reading thereof. You may also, and I need to see the prep prep <laughs> preparedness for this one. You might get a lecture. Okay. At least you might get part of a lecture that I can talk about right now. I might make it a two-part lecture. I think that might be good. I think, yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just planning the show out right now on the spot. I don't make a script or plan anymore. I just do this on the spot. You might get a t yeah, you, you might get a two-part lecture. First part will be in this program, second will be in the next. Okay. And then And this one I think you guys are going to like. And I've promised this a few times and now I'm going to fulfill that promise cuz I remembered. But I was talking about a short story that I was writing. That's not regression of life. But rather, it is called, I believe, The Walk. It's, uh, I hope you'll find it interesting. As a writer, I enjoy writing everything by hand and then transferring it to the computer. So I've got a lot more of this story done. I've got pages worth done, but I've never, I've never, uh, never transferred it. I have, at first I lost the papers, isn't that great? I mean, you should see this place. I've got literally about foot, foot, foot high stacks of papers everywhere. I mean, on my computer itself, I got about a five inch tall pile of just hundreds, if not thousands of papers. Um, you know, so it's buried in there somewhere. And uh, I just do a lot of writing and save a lot of stuff. That's important. But it's in there somewhere. I think it's... Yeah, oh, I see it right now. Here it is. Come on, let's not slip everything out here. And there's one. I think so. Yes, yes, yes. So there's... It's there. I can transfer it over. But uh, this will be a... Won't be the longest story in the world. Regression of Life is about 30 pages in now. It'll probably get to around 50 pages, even 60 in the end. Um, the walk will probably end up being between 5 and 15 pages. And I'm going to write another story, topic undetermined yet. But I'm going to write another one. And then I have a few very short little movements or sequences that I've written as well. That will just be uh, short little works. Very, very short. Just about a paragraph each. I guess even poems you can call them in a sense. And who knows, maybe I'll all publish it into a work one day and get it out. It's not going to be any sort of Barnes & Noble material, but, you know, I guess if anyone would ever want want one, you know. 
get it published for anyone's viewing pleasure or reading pleasure. Viewing and reading pleasure, same thing, I suppose. You are viewing the text. But anyways, I'm going to read you a segment from the uh, the walk, and I hope you'll you'll enjoy that. Anyways, what do we have planned for for now? All right, you know, short wave is a topic I talk about in every program because it's something significant to me, and uh, something that that you know is. There's always something happening. There's always a happening in the shortwave world. And I mention this, and, and oftentimes I can tie this in with something else. Today I'm going to talk to you all, right now, about the importance of writing in to something, to a program that you like. Okay? Now, this applies to shortwave radio, absolutely, but this also applies to anyone that does a podcast, that does a broadcast, if you know someone who does a radio show, if you have a favorite radio host, hear them on the AM dial, on the FM, on satellite, whatever it might be, right? If you like their program and they ask, hey, uh, you know, your comments are appreciated, let us know you're listening. I'm going to tell you the importance of writing in and why it is important to do that. To actually write in when they give you that email, you know, for you to leave your program comments or, you know, to, to shoot them an email and let them know you're there listening. And I'll tell you the importance of, of doing that and why it is critically important for a program, any program. A matter of fact, even videos, even on YouTube right now, the importance of leaving a comment on a video that you enjoy, that you want to see more of. To tell that trader, I watched your video, it was really good, I loved it, blah blah blah, however you feel you would wish to word that. Let's take a moment to look at shortwave from the shortwave perspective and then we'll tie things in. Of course, shortwave is still alive and well. There's actually a program I was listening to earlier. I think it's on right now. Let's see. Yeah, they're playing music. On 6040, if you're in North America and you got a shortwave receiver every Thursday night or every Saturday night, I'm sorry, every Saturday night from 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. on 6040 kilohertz, there's a program called the Mighty KBC, and they play some decent hits and tunes and music and uh, they specifically broadcast to North America and it comes in good. Their future unfortunately is at stake but they're confirmed to broadcast until I'm pretty sure it's uh, April 20, 24th I hesitate to say. I think it is, let me see. Yes, April 24th. Um, and after that, they're going to try to actually take the advice of many listeners and try to switch to a cheaper relay from North America. Because otherwise, they said it's too expensive to broadcast from Europe anymore, and they're going to have to shut down their station if it goes that way. So instead, because there's a... And see, this is where it comes with writing. There is such an outcry from North American listeners that they're going to seek to find a cheaper relay to North America so that they can keep this broadcast going. And that's an inadvertent example. I didn't even want to talk about that one, but it's what came up. Anyways, there's a shortwave station on air called, and I, I, I talked about this at the very tail end of the last broadcast, but I never gave the name of the broadcaster, but there's a shortwave broadcaster called The Voice of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And you may say, Iran? Why? Those people, they're, they're enemy of the U.S. I don't care. He heck, I hope the whole country gets blown up and they all die. You know, that's a really hardcore, harsh mentality, but some people have that mentality regarding Iran. And uh, 
what have you, but suffice to say, regardless of how you see it, they're, they're one of the last stable countries in the Middle East, um, not plagued by full-blown war. Anyways, the voice of the Islamic Republic of Iran. You can take them as a source of news, you can take them as a source of propaganda, you can take it as a source of entertainment. But whatever it may end up being, it's a broadcaster, and they have a significant presence on shortwave. Okay? Significant presence. They actually broadcast from three different sites in Iran on over 200 frequencies. They're a major, major broadcaster in many languages. They have an English service, Spanish service, Arabic, Russian, Bosnian, Albanian. They have services in Hausa, Greek, Italian, German, everything you could imagine, right? They have services in a, a shortwave broadcast in Portuguese, you know, even in some African languages, of course, Hindi, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and uh, even more. Turkish, of course. Uh, I think they even broadcast in uh, Kazakh to the to Borat. I shouldn't say that Kazakh stands all right. But they're a very major broadcast broadcaster with a very large outreach. Right, they've got a very large outreach. Broadcast to every continent, every corner of the globe. The U.S. is no exception. And the number of broadcasters that specifically target North America decreases every year. Goes down more and more. Even if there's a shortwave audience in North America, there's not enough people write. Not enough people say that they're listening anymore. I've fallen into that trap. I have. You know, the mighty KBC. Did I write to them tonight and say I'm listening? Or that I heard their signal? No, I didn't. We all fall into that trap. So they're a very big broadcaster. And one of those stations that you'll go, you'll go a few frequencies, you'll hear them, they're there. They have a definite presence on shortwave, and they're definitely one of those stations that keep the bands active and alive and lit up, you can say, with signals, and it's something to listen to. Well, they have a, uh, sometimes they have a problem communicating with their listening audience, but they sent an email out to a few people, one of which was, actually took responsibility and posted it on his uh, shortwave radio blog, but he pretty much said, and posted the email. He said, I got this email from the English service of the voice of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And they said that we've been faced with a decision to either switch to mediums such as satellite and the internet to relay our programs or to continue broadcasting via shortwave radio and if we make the first choice the entire station is going to go off the air it will be the loss of another major international broadcaster and they said however we want to let the listening audience decide we make the, and you might say, that's odd for a brutal dictatorship like Iran to say. But that's, that's what they, just, I guess that's how they operate, the station at least. And they said, you're the listeners. We conduct these broadcasts for the listeners. We want your opinions. We need your opinions. We want to know what to do exactly in regards of this broadcast and the future thereof. And as soon as I saw that, I decided, it's now or never. I have to write in. 
I've seen, I've looked back, I've looked at these old, you know, articles of all the stations that have gone off the air. I said, I can't assume that someone else is going to write in for me. Because chances are, someone else isn't. I have to write in. I have to explain clearly what I want. I have to do it. I have to get to that keyboard and start writing to them. Let them know they have a shortwave listener. Let them know that shortwave is still important and that they should continue broadcasting. So I wrote to them and we have yet to see what will happen. But hopefully it won't go off the air. They're still on the air as of now, but every day got to keep the fingers crossed. But as of now, they're still on the air. And I had to write in to do that. And that's one of the things I realized, that they probably probably weren't enough people writing in. And people probably began to wonder, is it worth it? Is it worth it to, to do this anymore? People were listening, sure. I've listened to their English service for a period every single night. I know other people who did too. I don't think any of us wrote in. But we were still listening. But how do they know that? They don't. Therefore, writing in, especially to a radio broadcast or to an audio program, is extremely important. Extremely important. As a matter of fact, for the heck of it, I'll read... I know some people like when I read anything, so I'll read my, uh, my letter to them. So this is what I wrote into them in response to their, what they said uh, regarding their potential discontinuation of shortwave broadcasts. I wrote, Dear members of the Islamic Republic of Iran Broadcasting, I have just heard the news regarding the potential discontinuation of shortwave broadcasts in favor of internet and satellite broadcasts. I would firstly like to express that I prefer to follow your programs on shortwave radio, not via satellite and the internet. While at a glance, shortwave radio may seem outdated and antiquated, but I can assure you that this is not the case. I myself listen to your English program via shortwave on a nightly basis. The signals can be heard clearly in New York, and I always enjoy every program and the contents thereof. I myself, let's see, and then where did I get to? I don't have the technology on hand to receive a satellite broadcast, and my internet connection can sometimes be poor, which may perhaps cause disruptions when listening live online. In my situation, listening to your broadcast via shortwave radio is my only option and is my best option. The quality of these broadcasts is excellent and the programs are received clearly. In North America and Europe alone, there are thousands of shortwave listeners just like me who, even as hobbyists with other sources of media available, we still choose to listen to your broadcasts via shortwave and not the other technologies. In other portions of the world, this is even more important. Consider locations even in the Middle East, such as Syria and Iraq. These two countries are in a perpetual state of war with the Islamic State and with other anti-government factions in their countries. Due, the co due to the constant warfare, there is very limited infrastructure in some parts. There are areas with little to no electricity and poverty is rampant. With no electricity, online listening is impossible and listening to satellite broadcasts is highly unlikely. Shortwave receivers are inexpensive and are available all over the world. Shortwave broadcasts can still be received when infrastructure is non-existent and when there is no power. When a region is devastated by war or natural disaster, shortwave radio is the only way in which news and potentially life-saving information can be, can be transmitted to those in need. The Middle East is not the only part of the world in which shortwave is still vital. Africa, Central America, Central and Southeast Asia, and India are all regions in which shortwave listenership is still extremely high, and which shortwave radio is used not only as a means of receiving news, but also as a means of entertainment 
and it allows listeners to become connected with faraway lands through cultural programs, which would be impossible without shortwave radio, given the infrastructure and state of some of these areas. Shortwave radio transcends geographical barriers and overcomes literacy, and likewise countries have the ability to block websites and therefore make online listening impossible. Shortwave broadcasts can cross borders and deliver news and information wherever it is necessary without disruption. Therefore, I implore you, staff of the Islamic Republic of Iran Broadcasting, to continue transmitting via shortwave radio for the foreseeable future. There are tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people who listen to your station via shortwave radio, and many of them will never get the chance to express their thoughts to you due to their situations. If shortwave broadcasts are discontinued, these listeners will one day tune in, expecting to hear the voice of Iran, but instead all they will hear is empty static. My regards. And that was my yeah, plea, you can say, to them. But I typed that up in about 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and uh, sent that out to them. Because it was something I felt strongly about, and I said, if, you know, how do I know if anyone else is going to write in? And even if someone does, one more letter is one more step closer to keeping them on the air. One more person saying that, you know, that, that they're listening. Not only that I'm listening, but also how shortwave radio is still beneficial in some parts of the world, and if not essential. So anyways, let's face it. If there's a program you like, there's a show you like, there's a YouTuber that you like, like their con content, whatever it is, don't do this after every video unless you'd like. But periodically, maybe monthly, maybe every two months, but write to them. Send them an email, give them a comment, send them a message. Say, I was watching your video, I was listening to your broadcast, I heard you on shortwave, whatever it may be. I really enjoyed your programs, I tune in, I watch your videos, I listen in all the time. Please keep it up. You have people watching your content, enjoying it listening please don't stop you have an audience you have people to do this for keep up the great work something as simple as that and many people don't under, don't realize how important that is i mean i'm going to use my own videos as a case and no no this isn't a this isn't my way of saying you got to write into VORW no that's not what i'm saying but these VORW programs get around 3,000 views, three to 5,000 views per show. Do I get 5,000 letters? Absolutely not. I get more along the lines of, you know, maybe 10 to 20 per program. I think that shows something as well that proves my point when it comes to shortwave listening as well, is that not every person listening writes in, you know? Out of three, let's say 3,500 listeners to VORW, right, I got about 20 letters. Okay? That should show you right there the amount of people who actually write in to the amount of people listening. And uh, I think that can be something to take note of and something that's even applicable in the radio world. But just remember, if, you, if, you, if there's something that you like and you want it to stick around, Write to them. Let them know how you feel about it. Okay? And oftentimes you might think, well, you know, the station, the broadcaster, the YouTuber, they're not going to read my crap. They're, they're just, they've seen thousands of letters like it. They're, they're just going to say, they're not even going to open it. Don't say that. Oftentimes, that's actually quite the opposite. I myself read every single letter. I respond to every letter. Okay? I know there's other people who do too. Even if they don't reply directly, chances are they've still read it. They've still digested it. They still might have thought to themselves or said to themselves or even relayed it to higher-ups that there are people who they're doing this for. That it's not futile. That it's not pointless. That their show isn't for nothing. But it's something that's very important. Just periodically. Why not? It'll take, take five minutes to send a short little email. No harm done there, right?
But if there's something that you like, you've got to preserve it. And this is one of the ways of doing so. One of the ways of keeping things going a little longer. By writing in and just letting them know that you like what they do and that they're not doing this for nobody. You know? That they have an audience and that they have people who actually enjoy their programs that are tuned in, that are listening. And I gotta drive this home because I think there's, you know, it's just something very important. Gotta take that, you gotta, you gotta do it while it's there. You know? Once it's gone, it's gone, and that's that. But that's what I have. That's what I have. That was my little lecture on, uh, on shortwave. People actually liked it, believe it or not. They actually enjoyed when I, uh, did the little scan on shortwave. You know, when I, uh, sat there and did the little scan. So what the heck, why not do it at another time and see what's on the air right now. Real quick, we're going to try a different band, because people liked hearing, I guess, all the stations or whatever. But, uh, it's, uh, 9.35, so we'll use a little bit of, a, a lower frequency, but some people are just curious as to what the current state of shortwave radio is in North America. So here goes, we'll turn the radio on and we'll see what we have here in North America at 9.35 p.m. on this one broadcast band. So you turn on the radio and this is what you hear in North America on shortwave. Let's see what we got. And now we have That's Brother, Brother Stare. You can tell he's real popular, of course. An innovative Yinger headset has been invented. The headset enables people to communicate in noisy environments. <laughs> And that's just a little example. You can see how it varies at different times and how it sometimes there is more to hear and sometimes there's less to hear, but very interesting nonetheless. And as you can see, there's still a variety to listen to at any given time. That still shows that even with some stations leaving and some stations staying, there's still always something to listen to on the shortwave bands and it can still be your window to the world. Anyways, I think what, uh, what we'll do now, 40 minutes in, is I think, how about we do this? How about we read a, a little excerpt from my story that I'm going to be adding to now. Now, it's not going to be a full-blown reading session like it was with uh, Regression of Life. And I only say that simply because it's, I don't have much to read at this point. So let's go to, let's go to Drive. But, uh. Anyways, let's see, maybe it was... Here we go. There we go. We got it. Okay. This isn't too long. It's only about a, a page and a half. But I hope you enjoy it. It's something I haven't worked on for about a year now, but... I plan on taking a little break from Regression of Life soon and finishing this one. This work is titled The Walk. 
Okay. As we all know, I enjoy taking night walks. I'm a very strong advocate of them. As a matter of fact, I think they can be actually soul soothing. But in this one, something's not right. I'm the main character, so it's written from my viewpoint. And I'm going to take a night walk. It's like any other night. As a matter of fact, actually a prettier night than most, by my standards. But something's off. And I can't seem to figure out what it is. But something's a little off. And things only start to get a little more off. Until something unexplainable, something otherworldly, something supernatural happens during this walk that can't be explained, nor will it ever be explained, but it will of course always be remembered. Ladies and gentlemen, I present you the walk. It was a cool evening in early November. The fall was still in its midst as fallen leaves coated both the roads as well as lawns. Seemingly, any available plot of land bore a fallen leaf, proving that the bloom of summer was concluded. Temperatures were in the upper 50s, 59 degrees Fahrenheit, the thermometer read before I exited my edifice to begin my constitutional. I checked my pocket watch as I began walking down my driveway. 11.58 p.m., the watch read. As I stepped down the driveway, the still, cool, and damp air engulfed my person. At the base of the driveway, I took a moment to peer down my street, to the left and then down to the right. The road was silent. It was not a long road by any means, nor was it a populated one. However, the occasional car would make its rounds down this street from time to time. This situation was a possibility, no doubt, since I was situated in a residential neighborhood. At this hour, oftentimes, one or two houses on the street were well illuminated, though tonight, blackness enveloped every structure, leaving these once hospitable residences in an exanimate state. At this hour of the evening, the sounds of distant traffic from the main road, approximately two-tenths of a mile to the east, or the noise of machinery from a local corporate and industrial park often filled the air as a dull, distant din. The sounds were never discordant, though, nor were they ever too loud in volume. Rather, they gave the impression of a white noise background and served as a constant reminder that you were never alone in this world. Tonight, however, there was no noise. The weather of this evening may be described by some individuals as unseasonable, Near 60 degrees, there was a fog of varying thickness covering the area. A light spray of mist hit my face as I looked down my street and listened to the sounds of the night. The orange-tinted streetlights reflected their luminous glow off of the damp road and off of the fog additionally. The night possessed an orange hue. In retrospect, it was a beautiful night. And as an introverted individual, the silence and solitude of the evening truly led to the awakening of an inner solace and contentedness. The weather was both that of personal comfort and led to an aesthetically pleasing environment. I conjectured that tonight was to be an enjoyable night. Having garnered sufficient observations of my surroundings, I straightened my tie and commenced my perambulation of the routine circuit which I had walked many a time before. The walk started the same as every walk previous had. I walked to the end of my street, turned left to walk down another road. Now this road was a somewhat busy road during certain times of the day, with houses to the left, hand side of the road, and the beginning of the corporate park on the right side. I walked across the empty road to the side which the corporate park began, heading south in direction, and I walked parallel to a large, single-story office building. 
with a small little industrial complex further down the road, connected to the complex. As I passed the small factory, I took notice that, that the familiar sound of the equipment inside was muted. Not even the generators that power the complex were uttering a sound, yet the lights in both the office and factory were on. Not a car populated the parking lot. And that's where the story ends. There's some work to be done. I, I might uh, lower down the language used in it a bit. I think that can actually take away from the story itself when you're trying to have to keep looking up what does this word mean, you know. Why is that word there? Why can't you use a simpler alternative? So I might tone down the language a bit. I might leave it. Your, your, uh, your thoughts are always welcomed, of course. But in the end, we'll see. We shall see. But I have more to, to write. And uh, we shall see in that regard. But pretty much, so far in the story, it's a real pleasant night, from my view. I always like walking in at the night when it's foggy and misty and not too cold. I love that. And the streetlights reflect this orangish glow off of the mist. I think that's great. I really do. I think that's absolutely great for a night walk. So it's an ideal night for this walk. But there's already something a little bit awry so early in. Have you noticed what it is yet? I imagine we all have. It's 11.58 p.m. Now at midnight, most people are getting ready to go to bed. Many are already sleeping or resting. But even though at 11.58, there's still people up. I'll take midnight walks all the time and I'll look out and I'll see people's houses still lit up. I'll hear cars still driving down the roads. I'll still be cars and parking lots. There's still life. But what do we notice here? It's 11.58. No lights on in any of the houses. No cars anywhere. No sound of any traffic. No noise from any of these industrial complexes. The world seems strangely empty. Hint, hint. But as we'll read later in the story as I begin to write more and make my edits, you'll notice that this problem is but a minor inconvenience to what's to come. Anyways, I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the story as we work on it. And uh, comments and Questions and feedback regarding this piece are greatly appreciated. And, you know, I already get it regarding the language used in the story. Uh, if it is to be toned down or kept as it is or organized better, I already understand that. But if you want to really drive that point to, to home, as I've said a second time in this program already, uh, you, can, you can feel free to contact me regarding that too. Nonetheless, ladies and gentlemen, feel free to contact me via one of three means youtube.com slash user slash report of the week click on the about tab send a message type in the contents of your message from there ladies and gentlemen simply send that message out and it will arrive in my youtube inbox otherwise dear listeners if you are more of an email user please send me a message to repweekinterview1 at gmail.com that's r-e-p-w-e-e-k-i-n-t-e-r v-i-e-w-1 the number one at gmail.com repweekinterview1 at gmail.com or to v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com that's v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com 
comments, questions, feedback regarding the story, always welcome. Other general statements, questions, or responses to questions offered by yours truly are also welcome at any of those may means. This is VORW, the voice of the report of the week. Coming up next is a lecture which I all hope you'll enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay tuned. This is VORW, the voice of the report of the week. This is VORW, the voice of the report of the week. Thank you for tuning in as always. And as you may perhaps be able to hear, this is a night walk. Therefore, meaning that this will be another installment of our lecture series, The Story of My Suit. Should one have made that assumption and guessed as so, you are correct. It's a cold night tonight. Seems to be a reoccurring theme, truth be told. Cold, cold, cold it is, yes. Yes, indeed it is. Therefore, I think I am going to cut this walk a bit short. It's, uh, 29. Isn't that something else? Yeah, 29 degrees. And, uh, frigid. But, that's the month of April for you. April is a month of temperature swings, and this is yet another one. April has been uh, exactly that. There's been days already in this month, just seven days in. We've already had days when it's been in the 40s, and days when it's been in the 80s Fahrenheit. But nonetheless, I mean, the thing I like about these months, at least that I get to break out everything, you know? Some days I can wear the, uh, overcoat and scarf, like tonight. Some days I can wear a raincoat. Some days I can just, just wear a suit. Nothing more. Tonight's one of those cold nights, so if I'm going with, uh... Well, the night I'm recording this, Friday night, if you watch the latest review, I, uh, I'm wearing that same suit, the gray and white pinstripe. With a black overcoat and a scarf. No hat tonight. Anyways, very cold. Um, it's a p pretty night, at least. Sometimes the coldness can take a lot of beauty out of it. Doesn't allow you to really focus 100% on the very nice sky. Rather, perhaps you can only devote 30 to 60% your attention to that and the rest is just oh, my hands are cold you know my legs are cold my ears are cold my nose is running whatever it may be but I just say well it's April I'm not gonna be like this forever as a matter of fact nights like this are, are few and soon to be far between but it's a it's a pretty night. I wish I was warmer so I could admire it more. But it's a mostly clear night. Can see all the stars, all the stars. A couple nights ago, I was thinking of the uh, the Fermi or Fermi paradox, which was talking about life in the universe or lack thereof. I thought it was interesting read, and uh, oh, there's that. But we'll save all that talk for 
maybe sometime in another program or whatever it may be. Nonetheless, let's get into the lecture, shall we? It's uh, 11 p.m. on this Friday night, so of course the roads are a little fuller with cars. Everyone who actually goes out and is extroverted usually uses the weekends to party, go drinking, whatever it may be. But roads are a bit more crowded than usual. Friday nights and Saturday nights aren't the ideal time to walk. If you want a truly undisturbed night walk and you can afford to do it, meaning perhaps if you have a day off or if you're not in education or employment and you got the time for yourself, consider taking a night walk on a weeknight Anytime between a Sunday night and a Thursday night, I recommend. I do. <laughs> oh boy, these people got a red light and I'm on their side of the road. They're gonna probably hear, probably hear them lock their doors. <laughs> Amusing. Sometimes I get that when I'm taking a walk. I'll uh, hear people lock their doors. <laughs> but truth be told, I've done the same thing myself. Whenever I see a, a biker or something, bicyclist. Anyways, let's hop into the lecture here. We're getting on a quieter street. 2010. That's where we left off. Before then, I had just learned how to tie a tie. And that had greatly expanded my repertoire. Now suddenly I had about 50 or 40 neckties, which I could tie. Now, understand that these aren't perfect knots, right? It takes time to become experienced, as it does with everything else. But as the saying goes, practice makes perfect. So nonetheless, had to catch my breath there. Nonetheless, ladies and gentlemen, they weren't perfect, but I suddenly had all these new ties, these new accessories. With that being said now, I could pair them and expand them with more things. Now, 2010 was a year in which I had learned a valuable lesson. Okay. It was in that year, because before 2010, mind you, I had just been interested in wearing suits, you know, in a modern fashion. And back then, 09, modern fashion meant wide lapels, three buttons, pleated pants, etc. Something which I would even approve of today. Obviously, modern in 2016 means, you know, skin tight. And I'll take a guess. I'd say, I mean, there are a few fellow fashion traditionalists who listen. I know that for a fact. But I'd go as far as I said, probably oh, 65% of listeners here would probably agree that a slim fit suit looks better than a traditional style suit. Or is sexier, you know, than a traditional style suit. And it all depends on how an individual looks at something, as the saying goes, you know, uh, really beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It's really how someone looks at something, how someone feels about it, what have you. But some people will see a slim fit suit, some guy, let's take the stereotypical, what a attractive suit wear it looks like today. You know, you take the... First, you gotta get the hair right. Okay, you gotta get some gel or some pomade. You know. Um, you gotta get the sides of it shaved, of course. It's mandatory. 
you got to get that little part, right? You got to slick the top back. So that's mandatory. All right, then with the the face itself, you got to have a good jaw, right? Got to have an aesthetic jaw. Oh, you got to have a beard too. Sometimes if you really want to go all out, got to get that mustache too, but a beard is minimum, right? If you want people fawning over you. Got to be tall. I'd say six feet minimum. And uh, and then for, in terms of how you dress, let's not get to body type immediately. Got to be skin tight. Got to literally be as tight as possible. Okay. Jacket has to go to the waist. Maybe a little bit above the belt actually today. Uh, lapels should be almost non-existent. Tie should be short and skinny. Um, pants should be so tight, you know, it's got to outline, you know, the, the crotch. You know, got to, you know, that seems a big thing today with all the fashion models. Got to show the that damned bulge. And uh, then, of course, you know, you, uh, oh, you got to wear, got to wear brown shoes. No matter what color the suit is, you got to wear brown shoes. And, uh, oh, you can't, can't forget, you can't wear socks either. And that's what's considered being well dressed today. By most. By most. Um, ten years from now, it'll be totally different, and people will be making fun of the slim fit suits today. Like how some people make fun of the suits from the 90s, or how some people make fun of those 70s suits today. They'll say, my god, I can't, can't believe I wore that, you know? You'll hear the same thing. When it's popular, people will praise it as good. When it's not, people laugh at it. But as I said, it's it's really defined who who looks at it. Everyone has different opinions on clothing. Uh, I myself, for instance, and probably a few others, look at modern suits with disgust. And uh, I could never wear one of them. But as I described uh, in perhaps too too much detail earlier. Some will look at modern suits as being extremely appealing and sexy. You know, it's just not for me. It's not something I want. That's that. But at the time in 2010, I wore... You know, I, I wore the modern suits at the time. I wore what was considered to be... To be, you know, popular. You now it's a more traditional cut. Okay. So what changed in 2011? What lesson did you learn? I learned two important lessons. And it may seem like a paradox. It may seem like they're both contradictory to each other. But you'll see in later installments of this lecture, right, you'll see that, you know, where, where we get with this and where this ideology takes me. Number one, I learned, right, to wear what you want to wear. Dress how you want to dress. At the same time, I also learned, while I could wear what I wanted to wear, and dress how I desire to dress, you're not going to be taken seriously all the time until you're a bit older. Allow me to elaborate. And then we'll cite some more specific examples. But look at it this way, dear listeners. In 2010, and this is the early months thereof, okay, I didn't quite have the resources to wear a suit and tie every day. Okay, this time in the week, I'd probably wear a suit and tie, oh, let's say, uh, between about three or four days out of the week. The rest of the days, I'd still wear something a bit more casual. I'd still wear something along the lines of khaki pants now 
black dress pants. Usually with a polo or button down. Sometimes it was tucked in, sometimes it wasn't. Sometimes I even wear it with an innocuous long sleeve t-shirt. At this point in time, jeans and shorts were banned from my casual attire. Okay. But I wasn't wearing a suit and tie every single day. And because at the time, you know, I'm... I was younger back then, of course, 2010, that's, goodness, six years ago. But because I was younger at the time, and simply because of how I look, I even looked younger than that. You know, right now I'm already in my, my 20s, and people still comment thinking I'm 14. And that's, you know, what a, that's just how it how it happens, how I look, right? So imagine, now going back six years, I probably appeared even younger, okay? And because how I dressed, it was never really taken seriously. It wasn't back in 20, 2010. So I'd always have to be accosted. People would ask me, oh, you know, what are you, you know, dressed up for, whatever it may be. You wouldn't be really taken seriously. It's always assumed you were doing something that required that manner of dress. Now today, thankfully, thankfully I do look a bit older, and uh, now no one ever asks me anything to that regard anymore. They just think I'm going to work, or when I'm out in public, they think I'm on lunch break. You know, that's it. The good thing around here, at least, I know in some Midwestern towns, and especially the West Coast, too. Nobody wears suits anymore. Right. On the East Coast, specifically New York, people still do. Okay, white-collar jobs, right? You work in an office, you're still expected to wear a full suit and tie to work every day. That's just how it is. That's just the dress code. So, today it's more accepted for me to wear one, but back then it was a bit more, you know, questioned upon. It was something that got on my nerves, but it was something that I eventually got used to. Now, still at that time, I was wearing, again, considered modern styles of suits. You know, I'm thinking... You're not going to notice this, but I'm making the loop back home now. And I'm thinking I'm going to stop at home, grab a pair of gloves, and then do this walk again so we'll be able to talk more. Because I have too much to say in too little time. Because right now my hands are painfully, bitterly cold. And uh, I don't want to get any sort of frostbite. So I think we'll make the pass home. I'll get gloves and then I'm going to go back out and we'll talk some more. Because tonight I have a lot to say. I want to cover 2010. Or at least most of the year. Anyways, you're not going to notice that, but I'll make verbal comments regarding it. Anyways. Now the other thing... Right. Two things I learned, of course, as I said. Can dress how I want to dress, but don't expect to be taken 100% seriously. Gotta wait a few years for that. Well, here's what we have. In the early months of 2010, I had started looking at fashions other than just modern suits. And of course, the modern suit at the time was just the jacket, tie. Now sometimes, back in 2010, they were really trying to push a three-piece suit. They were saying, it's back, everybody. 
you know. Three piece suits today are a disgrace. I'll still wear them, but in a very, very, very traditional manner. If I ever wear a three piece suit today, it'll be with a wing collar and a necktie, which is a Victorian era style. Or I'll wear a three piece suit with a bow tie tucked under the collar, and it'll look like I'm wearing a black neckband. Now, the style that Sigmund Freud wore. If you ever want to look at pictures of him, I'll sometimes wear it in that style. But anyways, I began looking at, uh, you know, how the different styles were in the past, and really, I began, even back then, to see that I liked Victorian era styles, that I liked the more old-fashioned styles, that I liked vests, three-piece suits. I liked deviating from the the normal, you know, what was considered these standard suits, as much as I enjoyed them, and as much as I enjoyed wearing them in that just standard style, I kind of wanted to change it up. I thought, you know, it might be interesting to add a hat to the suit. I think it might be interesting to wear a vest, you know? Even back then, I was already interested in the wing collar and tie combination. I didn't do much with it, though. But I was interested in expanding a little bit. So, in early 2010, I got a few more accessories. Okay, I got two vests. Right, a black vest, which came with an accompanying black bow tie. And I also attained a red vest. Now, it's not like a bright red, it was like a dark red, like a, you know, it wasn't anything flashy. And a dark red vest, which I wore with an accompanying red tie. And that red tie, it's a necktie, I still have today, it still fits. And it was a one-size-fits-all tie. And while the vest is long gone, the necktie is still there and it's still worn. Bow tie is a bit small now. It's, it was smaller. But I was interested in more traditional wear, okay? I was interested in a bit of more traditional wear. At the same time, in 2010, I made a purchase, which is, oh great, oh boy, don't tell me, So anyways, you know, sometimes I hate people. Yes, sir. Degenerates. Some, uh, what an awful night to do that too, honestly. Some guys, uh, I don't want to cross their paths. Some guys usually park on the street and go into the woods and, you know, drink some beers and shoot some heroin and uh, all that. And that's the same crew. And they do it. They're so stupid. They usually just go out and around like 11 p.m., 11, 15 p.m. They do it then. Why? I don't know. Why Why don't we think? I don't know, but that's what they do. So I had to divert my course. Anyways. Anyways. 
in 2010 I made this purchase also of an article of clothing which believe it or not of all things I still use today okay it's an overcoat black overcoat now of course back then you have to realize it was a lot longer on me but even today it still goes down below the knees a little bit But I probably wanted to, you know, get something that I'd that would last for a while. I wanted to get a real quality garment that would last for a long period of time. And uh, this was it. Okay. It's a black overcoat. Three buttons. Wider lapels. And... I got it mostly for the winter to wear, but at the same time, and just in the way that it looks, it's more of a formal, traditional black long coat. And with that, in 2010, it's kind of another thing of my little push to a more traditional fashion, okay? My fashion today is oftentimes conflicted. There's sometimes when I really want to dress very traditionally and Victorian, and other times I want to dress more modern, you know? So sometimes I want to wear a wing collar and a frock coat. Other times I wish to wear a, uh, just a standard suit. That's no different, that, that really is no different you know, today as it was back then. Back in twenty, went back in twenty ten, I had a push for more traditional fashion. Okay. Back in twenty thirteen, had a push for traditional fashion, with also a push for a very modern fashion too. That kind of collided. And today, twenty sixteen. There's once again another push for traditional fashion. It's very cyclic, you can say. But 2010, especially the early months thereof, you know, they they possess probably the first the first real push for that. Now mid-2010 had more of that general general expansion. Got a few more ties here. Perhaps a few more shirts. I think I did attain a few more white shirts in total. But in late 2010 there were again a few more little gradual purchases, you can say. Now, I think you're starting to get the picture of how my wardrobe built up to what it is today. Gradual acquisition of garments over a long period of time. Okay? Gradual acquisition over a long period of time. I didn't just go out to a retailer and buy myself 30 suits and 25 pairs of pants, 200 ties, 50 shirts. I didn't just go out at once and do that. Rather, I gradually built up. Got a few here, 
Got a few there. And that's what I did. And you'll see what happens in late 20, 2010. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I, uh, I lied. As a matter of fact, you're going to be getting now another night walk. This one, however, tells a story of an encounter back in 2014. A very interesting one, by the way. And I hope you enjoy it. Next night walk regarding the clothing will be perhaps in the next program or the one after. Nonetheless, I hope you enjoy this next night walk. 50 minutes in length. Do enjoy, ladies and gentlemen. So, there's no set topic. This is uh, totally miscellaneous. But this evening I said, you know, I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going to go for a walk. And not only am I going to go for a walk, I'm going to bring my recorder with me. And as I perambulate the streets, I'm going to record myself. And here we are. It is oh, it's today. I think Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday, the thirteenth of April, twenty sixteen, of course. And here we are, a night walk. This is a true night walk now. It's uh. Well, not a, not a totally true one. There's still going to be people around in traffic. But not as much as usual. I, I will say that. Okay. 12, uh... Oh, it's 12.30 a.m. right now. I'm walking along the main road. It's, uh... Oh, it's a pretty night, ladies and gentlemen. Crystal clear skies this evening. A very pretty blanket of stars overhead. Now, compared to the last night walk, it's uh. <laughs> no, it's been temperature wise at least only slightly warmer. But. I come at least a little bit better equipped than I did with the last one. Because tonight, you know, I'm, I've got my standard overcoat and everything. And what the main problem really was with me in these near freezing temperatures is my hands, right? I can't really wear gloves, even the nice leather ones, because it's too bulky for the little microphone I carry on, uh, on these walks. And my fingers get cold, they get red, they get numb, and it's too painful to carry on. So I said, you know, there's a solution to this. Hand warmers. And don't you think I had a package of two of these? So I broke out one. And it's gonna stay in my coat pocket. Right now my left hand is clutching it. Getting nice and warm for when it needs to hold the microphone. Then I'll switch the warmer to the hand that was exposed to the air more recently. Let that one warm up. And uh, vice versa, and I think that'll help solve this problem, you can say, with the, uh, the cold hands. I myself have never been one to use hand warmers, but these ones, so far it's working. They're called Hot Hands Hand Warmers. What it is, you rip it out, you shake it a bit, it's apparently supposed to be anywhere between 135 and 155 degrees Fahrenheit. 
air activated. There it is. Lasts for a good 10 hours, he said. Now let's switch. And, uh, you know, we'll see. We'll test the effectiveness and uh, we'll see how this one works, but hopefully good. Hopefully it'll uh, <laughs> make it a little more bearable. But all in all, I think it'll be interesting to see. It'll hopefully keep my extremities nice and toasty. You know, I'm thinking about VORW 117. Alright. Oh, and by the way, when I mentioned night walks, midweek, best time to walk. And that's it. Case closed. In terms of traffic, this is the main road where this car is going all the time, and what do we got? Barely anything here. Two cars, and that's it. So, if you got the time to do a night walk, midweek, anytime, Sunday night through Thursday night, is the time you want to go out. Okay? It's a, as I said, a Tuesday night. I mean, it's after midnight now, I guess it's the very early hours of Wednesday morning, but <laughs> everyone says Tuesday night. You know, I was thinking about VORW number 117. You ever have something and you don't know what to do with it? That's the case I'm in. Right now I... I don't know what I want to do with this... VORW show. Well, that's the truth. Just don't know. Part of me... You know, I don't know. Maybe I'll upload this for the next one, give myself a little week off with the night walk, and maybe you guys will get two night walks back to back in 117. I don't know, people like the night walks. Heck, maybe I'll do that, right? Let's make a VORW first. Why not, as I say? This night walk won't be too long in my Switch the hands again. Review, bro. Yes. You, uh, I mean, it's clear. You like the night here. For the most part, nocturnal. Yes, I am. You know, you go out at night a lot. Whether it be out to restaurants, do reviews. I've seen you do reviews at night, which I have, of course. You go out on the streets at night, like I am right now. I mean, maybe it's just me, Review Bra, or maybe it's something else, but doesn't Knife usually have the reputation for, you know, having, having, uh, <laughs> having all the bad people come out, right? As we're all taught as youngins, 
Nighttime is evil. You know. Nighttime is is bad. Anyone you see out after dark, they're either a drug user, they're either a robber, or they're either a murderer. Alright? And any animal you see out after dark is gonna kill you. And that's what's usually... Well, that's the ideology that many people look at night with. No, I don't. But, of course there's truth to it. However, I should mention that in the daytime, <laughs> that in the daytime there's people out who are just as dangerous and animals that are just as dangerous. Doesn't matter. Night is always given a bad rep. Because it's always as portrayed in cinema and literature. Even music to a extent. You know, I've decided I'm going to do this circuit twice. This will be a longer one. But... Night is always given a bad rep. Always has been. But review, bro, what I'm asking you is this. It's, it's simple, alright? You ever, uh... I mean, you go out at night all the time. You're always out at night. You're one crazy Ebena for, to traverse these empty streets without care in the middle of the night. But, uh, have you ever, any, have you ever seen anything weird? Perhaps on your night walks or while you're out at night or just at night in general? Or you have any, uh, any neat stories you'd care to share with us? Well, let's sing. The first thing that comes to mind is a encounter from 2014. Now, I have paranoia. It's known, it's most likely part of an underlying, you know, far more severe thing. I won't venture into that territory this time around. But it's known. Okay. Oftentimes I always scan the crowd. You know. Don't know who's out there, what their intentions are, but nonetheless. It was 2014. Okay. Which is a, a fairly recent time in, you know, in history. Very recent, actually. And in this YouTube channel's history as well. I mean... For the most part, it was the beginning of how this channel is today. The traditional suits, the ORWs, all the reviews, etc. But it was 2014 when this night event happened. And, uh... I think it'd... It'd be worth marking. See, something just happened right now that I think would scare some people, but I also don't even care at this point. I'm walking down this long, long, empty road. And from the left, 
I mean, there's some buildings behind there. That's where it came from. But through these woods, here's some guy, <laughs> some guy yelling, this high-pitched yell. And well, either he's drunk or it's his problem, not mine. But anyways, no, the moon's looking very pretty, by the way. Nice, uh, you know, people always call it a half moon, but it's a, it's a quarter, really. Got to got to consider the dark side of the moon too, which no one ever sees. Nice quarter, perfect quarter moon. Very pretty. Doesn't not completely white, has like a you know, it's got that whitish glow with a little bit of a goldish tan to it. Very pretty. The moon is tonight. Now anyways, this is back from 2014. Sit back, relax, it's review bra story time. And I've always been alert, all right? I've always been, you know, that type. Now my house is, uh, is all right. There's been some incidents. One time in 2011, someone tried to uh, kick the front door down, but the police were called and Nothing ever happened again in that regard. In 2013, <laughs> this one is this one's good. Get, get a load of this one, right? There was uh, at the end of the month, you were allowed to put any garbage that you had, like any trash. Like I'm not saying like food waste, but say you had an old lawnmower, right, and it was broken, and you didn't want to drive all the way to the dump, you could put it out on the curb, and at the end of the month, the uh, garbage company would go around and they'd pick up larger items like that for free. Or sometimes it's fun, you could leave them out a few days earlier, and, uh, you know, you'll get people... <laughs> And it's fun to see people pull over and just take the crap for themselves. The other day, I actually did that with these two two lawnmowers. Those things were gone so fast. Anyways. But it's known. If you have a junk that you want to get rid of, at the end of the month, you put it on the curb. That's that. So, nothing wrong with that. It's what everyone does, all the neighbors. So we put out some things, nothing too horrible. A few broken little plastic crates, you know. A couple uh, old cans of paint. You know, some old little broken little bits and pieces of miscellaneous household items. But it's nothing crazy. It wasn't anything horrible. Put a few of those little things out at the curb, but day or two in advance. Alright, nothing wrong with that. So, I wake up one afternoon at around, this is 2013, I wake up at around 2 p.m. and I see where my My father calls me. He says, uh, on the phone, he says, you know, uh, I don't know what this is. I don't know if it was some sort of prank or what. But all of the trash that we put at the street to be picked up was kicked off of the curb and onto our driveway. So I don't know if some animal did this or if someone did this or what, but, uh, he showed me a picture he took before we put it back on the curb 
they said, you know, I don't know what to make of this. I now just let it be. Nothing to worry about there. That was that. Then we went out and ran some errands. I'm looking at the uh, on the computer, and all of a sudden, not thirty minutes later, I hear a car pull up right outside the house. Well, I go to the front window to investigate. What do I see? It's a real fancy, polished, expensive black BMW. Like the kind uh, Elliot Rogers drove. You know, a real pretty car. Pulled up. In front of the house. Driver gets out. Now, some people expect when there's someone who's got a temper and is willing to act on it. Society often says, and this does hold true in many situations, but it depends on the person and their level of extroversion. Society always says, you know, it's always the young people who who always let their tempers go too far. Always those, you know, those youth in their teens and twenties, right? They're the problem. They're the ones who can't control themselves. They better learn. And I'm not gonna lie, that is true. All depends on the person and the level of extroversion thereof. You get some alpha Chad, you know, he's sitting there, had one too many to drink, and he's upset about something, you better believe he's going to do something to vent his anger in a real public display. But, when I say that it can be, for the most part, anyone, depending on their level of extroversion, That means anyone of any age. This driver wasn't young. He came out. Kind of looked like your standard a-hole. You know, he was wearing uh, some khaki dress pants from my recollections. He was wearing like a blue striped button down, tucked in, but with like too, like too many buttons unbuttoned to kind of show off his chest. He had these black sunglasses on. And he was bald. He was completely bald already. So he must have been probably up near 50. You know, one of those guys who's over the hill, middle-aged, but is trying to, you know, trying to look at least 20 to 25 years younger. Trying to get those glory days back. You know, heck, if I live long enough to be middle-aged, you know, you see some of those guys with the hair balding, they're desperately trying to comb it over, trying to, whatever those are, the Bosley hair implants, you know, all these things. You know what I'm going to do if my hair starts graying or balding or even prematurely balding or graying? I'm going to embrace it. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm not going to comb anything over. If I bald, I bald. If my hair gets gray, it's going to get gray. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I've kind of thought, you know, I wouldn't mind if it actually started falling out or graying a little bit already. It doesn't bother me. I need them. Many people, that's their worst nightmare, but to me, it doesn't bother me any. I think it would be kind of, kind of neat, actually. I'm not interested in showing off to, to the world how I look. What I'm interested in is being comfortable with how I look. No matter how that is or what it consists of. Now anyways, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, we'll do this a second time. We'll do this little loop here. Why not? But anyways, ladies and gentlemen. So... This is one of those guys who's, 
you know, trying to look young. Probably was a real macho, you know, back in the day. So for whatever reason, he didn't like the garbage that was on my property and all the neighbors' properties that was going to be gone in less than 24 hours, ruining his beautiful view in his neighborhood, which he obviously owns and obviously has the right to tell everyone what to do. Sarcasm. So he comes over and he starts kicking that stuff and throwing it again. This is the second time, too. Throwing it at the house. You know, extremely violently. Clearly, he's genuinely upset over this garbage. Whole thing lasts a few minutes, he gets back in, drives away. You know, go out, start cleaning it up. I decide, well, I'm gonna put it near the garbage can so he, he doesn't have to make me clean this up again. And this neighbor across the street just comes out with the most puzzled look on his face and just says to me, what's, what's this guy's problem? No. Anyways, the neighbor, he's, he was a good guy. He's moved away at this point, but he was a good guy. He was this, I think, this German businessman. You know. He, uh, he said, well, I was watching from my window, too, when I took down the guy's plate number. But, uh, honestly, I, I honestly don't think you'll need it. And he literally pointed two houses down the street, and he said, yep, that's the house he drove into right there. I just thought, my gosh, what an idiot, you know? If you're going to do something that's stupid, honestly, do it. <laughs> do it farther away from where you actually live. Right, anyways, after that, he's given us no problem since. Every now and then, I'll periodically think I had to go over to his yard one day and just dump a bag of garbage in his yard and see how he thinks about that. But... <laughs> I've never done such a thing, and I ignore all primal tendencies to conduct such an action. Now, that's the precursor. This happened, because this was a daytime encounter, this... Oh gosh, this was midday. The 2014 encounter now, this midday one was 2013. Okay, this, this midday one from 2014, okay, was a night one now. And this one, I did call the cops. Uh, was it necessary? Wouldn't say so. Was it justified? You be the judge. But I felt that this person's actions and behavior was far too suspicious not to do something about given the circumstance. Late June 2014. Pretty much same life I have now, a few personal changes for the better, but anyways, late June 2014, in a week, we're going to leave, me and the folks are going to leave for a two-week vacation to Hawaii, Hawaii was very nice by the way. If any of you were listeners from 2014, I gave a whole VORW about my Hawaii trip. And, uh, I know there's a few of you. I know there's a few of you guys who are, who are listening for, since 2014. I know that for a fact. So a few of you remember the Hawaii venture. Right? 
But anyways. All started about a week before we left. Because we were going to be gone from the house for two weeks. So already then, as many may know, one of the prime times that an intelligent robber will break in is when they know the family is gone on a long vacation. They got that house to themselves. Nobody's coming there to check in on it. Or if anyone is, they're not going to be staying there. They can just come and go as they please for the most part. So already, that's a time when you're already a little concerned about the security of your house. Even just then, even if there's no suspicious activity beforehand. You want to lock the doors, make sure they're locked. Make sure they're locked again. And so forth. My goodness, what is this with my shoe, ladies and gentlemen? Shoe, are you alright? You doing okay? Yes? Yeah, you guys are okay? Alright. Fine. I thought it came untied, but it didn't. We know at this point that, you know, the time before vacation is really the prime time for a or a time during a vacation is one of the prime times for a robbery, burglary, you know. So already, it's, most people usually make sure the door is locked, check if it's locked again, you know, that kind of thing. Flash, flash back about a week before, okay? 4.30 a.m. I was doing some work, about to go to sleep. And I was listening to Shortwave, had my receiver at that point. I was listening at the window to, of all people, Brother Stare. I actually did listen to Brother Stare more back in uh, 2014. I, did I seriously listen to him? No. I could make, when I was really, really depressed, I could make a few connections to him. I said, you know, well, Brother Stare, everyone hates him. Everyone hates on him. You know, nobody likes him. Everyone hates me too. Nobody, you know, people tell me to die too. And I could relate to that. I still can. But I realize at this point that Brother Stare is an unsavory character. <laughs> you know. And, uh, <laughs> was never that good of a person to begin with. Kind of say you get what you get. But anyways. I was listening to Brother Stare. Late at night. when I see a set of headlights start coming down the road. This is from the front window. Well, I think nothing of it. I say, you know, I literally thought nothing of it. Cars drive by down this road all the time. Not the most trafficked road, but there's cars that go down at all hours. Nothing new there. So, sitting on the couch looking out the window, I was waiting for this car to go by. And all of a sudden, the headlights shut off. I think, well, that's a little odd for the person to park in the street, but it happens all the time. And then I hear the slam of a car door. And I think, well, it's 4.30, what's going on? I take a look. Now, this time I'm a little curious. I move to another room to got a better view of this car. It was a, uh, 
like a silver colored SUV. The driver was a Hispanic male in his 30s. He was wearing jeans and like a white, uh, like a white, uh, I forget if it was a t-shirt or a tank top or a wife beater or what. He was wearing one of the things. It was jeans and a white shirt of some kind. But this is what struck me out. He stepped out of his car and from his view, none of the lights looked like they were really on in my house. But he stepped out of his car, stood in front of it, and for a good 10 minutes, just looked at my house. Just watching it, getting a good view of the side of the house. And I was watching him back in the room, there weren't any lights on. I was looking back at him. He couldn't see me, but I could see him. But he was just looking at the house. Now, isn't that creepy or what? Just to say that to begin with, right? 4.30 a.m., you see this car stop, and it's just this guy standing out there looking at your house for <laughs> way longer than anyone should. And you're just staring at it. Then he gets back into his car, slowly drives down the street, And that's it. Drives away. I thought, well, as I was going to sleep, that was really weird. But, well, it happens. I didn't say anything of it, didn't do anything about it. The next night, came and went with no issues. But now let's say it was a Wednesday night. Let's say it first started on a Monday night. Now it's a Wednesday night. This time it was around 4 a.m. This time it wasn't at the window. Okay, I was on the computer because I didn't really think anything of it to begin with. 4 a.m. Again, I hear the faint bang of a slamming car door. I think, wait a minute. What's going on? Is this that same guy? Can't be. I leave things as they are, I move to the front window, and this time, I see that the guy's car is pulled up the street now, past my house. But I see it the same guy, Hispanic male, 30s, same exact guy as the last time, same SUV, 4am this time. out of the car, looking at the other side of the house. Looks at it really carefully, carefully observes it. It's like he's looking over every single corner, every window, everything on the other side of the house now. So he was looking at one side yard, now he's looking at the next side yard and side of the house. Then after about five, ten minutes, packs up, drives off again. And this time I said, nah, that's, that's suspicious. Two times now this person's done this. Different spots, looking right at my house. Something is up. And we're going to be leaving for a two-week vacation now in just a handful of days. I said, something's, something's wrong here. The next day I speak up, I recount my incident, and I say, you know, I think something should be done about this. And, you know, anyone willing to listen says, well, 
I think that is a little strange, but... I don't think there's enough evidence, truly, to really do anything yet. But please keep your eyes peeled. Very next night, Thursday night, let's say. This time I'm ready. This time I say, you know, I'm gonna sit by that window, I'm gonna have the lights off around 4 a.m. I'm gonna see what happens. So, get to the window at around 3.45. Around 3.55, lights are off, looks like everyone's asleep. Don't you think I see this very same silver SUV creep down the street? This time, doesn't stop to the left of my house and look down. Doesn't stop to the right of the house and looks down. The guy stops right across the street. This time to get the view of the front of the house, I figure. Now this time he doesn't get out of his car. Rather, he rolls down the passenger or the driver's side window all the way turns the car off so the inside and everything the engine's off it's all dark he just has his head cocked to the left at my house and now he's looking at the front looking at where all the windows are the door perhaps now I don't know why I thought to do this but this is what I did and this is what really made me call the police afterwards and perhaps put this to an end as the guy was sitting there, he was looking for about a minute or two, when I said, you know, now or never. What did I do? I got up and remind you that the, all the lights downstairs were off. I got up, I went to the front door. First thing I did is I turned the light on outside, it's a big bright light. And then I opened the front door and stepped out onto the front porch. <laughs> this guy's right across the street there. And as soon as I do that, he rolls up the window, turns the car on, and just floors it down the street. Wildly makes a right turn at the end of the street, almost clips the stop sign, I remember. And he just floors it out of there. Like he literally just put the pedal down on the gas and just floored it. He wanted to get the hell out of there when he saw that I'd, I was actually up and saw him doing this. And he got out of there fast. <sighs> Unfortunately, too fast for me to be able to get a license plate number. I think he actually obscured his license plates, if I recall correctly. But he got out of there. told everyone the next day, I called the cops, they said, you know, I reported what this guy looked like, the car that he was driving, the times that he's been stopping by, his behavior. They said, you know, we're going on a two-week vacation, we're going to be leaving this house, and this is what we have to deal with now. Very unnerving and even scary to say. So... They ran extra police patrols through the area for that next two weeks. We locked everything up, we hid things, we, you know, had a safe deposit box in the bank, put anything that's really worth anything in there. And we got back and the house was fine, nothing was bothered, no sign of entry or someone trying to enter, everything looked good, everything was fine, that's how it was. But that's my story of uh, one of the weirdest things I've seen at night. And uh, surely I think it was a weird one. And a scary one too. Now, was this encounter someone just minding their own business and wrong place, wrong time, and me being too overprotective of my property? 
Was just my paranoia getting the best of me, or do you think this person had ulterior motives? It wasn't just enjoying the night breeze while looking at my house, but it might have been casing the place out. I, to this day, don't know. I'm up all night every night, and I've never seen that guy ever again. I don't know. Who's to say, ladies and gentlemen, but... What would have happened should I haven't called the cops and gone outside and shown this guy that I'm out, I'm up. And that I saw him doing what he was doing. He got caught in the act. Who knows? House could have gotten broken into. Life could have been totally different. Who am I to say? But I think I did the right thing by intervening, calling the police, and giving this guy a sign that he might, he might think he's watching us, but we're also watching him too. So who can say in the end, if I thought his behavior was very, very suspicious and uh, downright frightening in a sense when it really happens to you, you think about what could happen, what could have happened. But in the end, everything worked out fine, but uh, still a little story for all you VORW listeners now, two years later. But, uh, that's what I got. This is VORW, the voice of the report of the week. This is the night walk segment. It's probably around 1 a.m., 1.30 a.m. right now. Let's see how long we're recording. Probably around 1.10 a.m. at this point. And here we are, wrapping things up. Hope you enjoyed that little story, ladies and gentlemen. Any comments on the story are greatly appreciated. If any of you listening are uh, law enforcement, former law enforcement, have law enforcement connections, want to chip in, give your thoughts on what happened there, always appreciate it. I'd love to get a letter from you and hear what you got to say. If you'd like to just give in any general comments, if you're just a regular listener, sounds great. And, uh, truth be told, if you were in my situation, number one, after the two other encounters and you saw this guy in front of your house, would you have gone out and tried to show him that someone's here? And would you have called the police? Or would you have just shrugged it off and let it go? Very curious as to what you would have done. Comments are always welcome at repweekinterview1 at gmail.com, vorwinfo at gmail.com, or via the YouTube message system. That's all I got for you now, ladies and gentlemen. This is VORW, the voice of the report of the week. And that's all that we have for today, ladies and gentlemen. This is VORW, the voice of the report of the week. Do write us with any comments or questions or general remarks on this program. Again, this is VORW, the voice of the report of the week. Closing up today's broadcast, we will be heard again early next week via the same medium, youtube.com. That's all that I have for you. Please write to us with any questions or comments or general statements you have, which will be right in the next show, along with any ones left for the last show. Please write to us at youtube.com slash user slash the report of the week. Click on the about tab and send message. Otherwise, write to us at repweekinterview1 at gmail.com. That's R-E-P-W-E-E-K-I-N-T-E-R-V-I-E-W-1, the number one, no spaces between all the letters or numbers, at gmail.com. Or write to us at vorwinfo at gmail.com. That's vorwinfo at gmail.com. Again, no spaces between anything there. No matter what via email or via YouTube. Your emails will get to the same destination. That is my eyes and then on to this show. That's all I have. Good day. This is VORW.